house plants to grow. Does that, does that show? All right, perfect. I'm sharing my screen. It's perfect. Um, whoops, let's go back. All right. So I added here Northern Virginia um, just a little bit because I, I know how um, important it is when we're talking about house plants, um, you know, the, the temperature that they need and how different it can be uh, depending on where you live. Um, but most honestly, um, indoor house plants are, are pretty much the same. And um, as long as you, if you're keeping them inside, there aren't too many um, differences depending on really where you live. Your, your biggest difference is going to be your humidity, which I'll talk about, and then what windows you kind of want to put your house plants in. So um, I really just started doing this kind of house plant gardening thing maybe two years ago. I'll show you later in my PowerPoint um, which plants started it all. Um, and pretty much it was something that was one of the, I was told was one of the easiest plants to keep alive and I just could not do it. And that plant specifically is what made me actually engage in this um, master gardening program. And I've just slowly have been getting a lot better um, at two things, keeping my plants alive and accepting that I will also kill some. So I, I just tell them, you know, rest in peace. I'm sorry I couldn't keep you, but we'll do better, you know, next time around. Still learning. And that's what I like to tell, um, you know, all my kind of newer gardeners, whatever type of gardener you are or that you want to be, um, the air process is actually also just as important as, you know, seeing your success. So um, with that, I will go on to my next slide. And oops, okay, I think my computer is just a touch slow. Um, so here I have why indoor slash container gardening. I know a lot of master gardeners, a lot of people really like to um, do gardening outside. Um, wildlife growing is something I'd like to get into, but uh, first want to make sure I can keep some plants inside alive and deal with pests and all that kind of stuff. So it's a great place to start um, gardening. Uh, container gardening. A lot of these um, house plants are air purifiers, which is really great um, to protect, you know, um, just the, the different kinds of things that we can have in our home um, while we're sleeping or just in general. They add life and color to really any room. Um, even your darkest of rooms can potentially still have a plant to add a pop of color and a life. They can boost your mood. Um, it's a great activity or hobby for people who like to stay indoors. Um, and they can provide you with a sense of accomplishment. And then, of course, all of the different house plants will have their own individual and unique qualities. And for a couple of those, I touch on that in this PowerPoint. So I have here where to purchase your plants. This is something that is, has, was also kind of trial and error for myself. Um, I, you know, not going to mention any specific places, but you'll have some stores that you may go to who overwater and underwater, they look great when you bring them home or, and, and then, you know, a week later, they've all died because there's just complete root rot underneath, or, um, maybe it was a good price because they use the, you know, cheapest of soils possible. So um, spending a little bit more money on your plants is probably just a better, safer place to start. Um, your local garden center is a great place. I love purchasing mine off Facebook Marketplace. Uh, and constantly people are moving, relocating, and they have these very beautiful, mature plants that they're so happy to give to another home where they'll be happy and taken care of. Of course, there are your different subscriptions as well, the Sill, Bloomscape, Urban Stems, and then of course you have your local farmer's market. Sometimes, um, you know, Boy and Girl Scouts, they will have fundraisers and drives and all of that great stuff. Usually those are all pretty safe places to get your plants to start off. 
then we have tests and control. I may have been able to do this afterwards, but I just thought I would start with this. I know that I mentioned, you know, um, house plants can be a little bit easier than outdoor plants, but it is really important to remember that you can still get pests on your plants inside. So all of these that you see on the side, I've dealt with them all. Up in the top, we've got a thrip, we've got a spider mite, we have white flies and aphids. And these are pretty much the only ones that I've really dealt with inside. Um, oh, and fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are of course very important and they just kind of happen from overwatering, but they're very easy to control. Most of these plants are very easy to control. If you're monitoring your plants every day, you will notice it. Most of them um, multiply very quickly. The spider mites will leave like a web over the leaves. Thrips are literally something that's going to be flying around from plant to plant. So again, if you're monitoring your plants, you will see those. Um, aphids will leave your plants, uh, your like nice beautiful green leaves with yellow or white kind of marks because um, they're eating at your leaves. So down just very quickly, I talked about control. Um, I really just prefer to wash the plants off in the sink really, really well. Depending on the type of plant, the water can be harder or softer. Uh, then, of course, you will have to really make sure that in order to not get root rot, that you really let those roots dry out. That's the trickiest part about just kind of watering all of the um, pests off. Then I really like to use neem oil. It's probably, you know, my favorite spray. I keep it in a spray bottle. I buy concentrated and I just kind of keep my leaves sprayed um, with to, in order to prevent and then also to get rid of some of these pests. Diatomaceous earth is a great one uh, when you just have way too many pests. I've mostly used this on, I do have a rosemary bush outside, big beautiful rosemary. <clears throat> and I had a couple of just bad pests on that. Diatomaceous earth is like a powder and you would want to spray that or I don't know, powder spray, however you want to describe that outside, because that's dangerous to inhale and you don't want all that inside. Then natural predators, I don't, I'm not going to release a bird inside my family room, um, but I did still go ahead and put that in there. And of course we all know ladybugs are um, great heavy eaters. For the gnats, sticky traps, super easy. Buy them on Amazon, anywhere you go. It's kind of like what you would put up for flies like in your garage and they will be gone in 24 hours. Go on to my next slide. So here we're finally gonna start talking about some of the plants. Some of these, I think most of the plants I put in this um, presentation, I also have. So if at the end, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer, maybe based on um, some of my individual successes uh, with these plants. So uh, pothos um, is really, really beautiful vining plant. Um, there are a couple different kinds. This is a yellow um, pothos. I personally like the marble white ones. I have two of those in my bedroom. Um, most of your container um, plants, you're gonna pretty much all of them have well-draining potting soil. I know a lot of really great master gardeners out there who like to make their own soil. I haven't gotten there yet. Right now I'm just sticking to what I know to make sure I'm keeping everything alive. And uh, Maybe in a couple of months I'll go ahead and play with that, but well-draining potting soil, you can find it anywhere. Um, the climate, uh, they like about 60 degrees and up. For humidity, I personally prefer to spray these guys. They do enjoy a little bit of misting around them. And you really want the soil to dry out completely between watering. And then when you do water it, you wanna water it very heavy, very deep, place it in the sink, let the water run out um, completely, let it dry and then hang it up. So. Nutrients, they're not a very heavy feeder. You can feed them monthly or bi-monthly. I prefer um, the fertilizer that you can, you know, concentrate it, put it into the water, and I'll use that um, 
fertilize water in order to give them some additional nutrients for their light, bright, and indirect light. So most of these are gonna be in like an Eastern facing window, at least here in my house, that's been working great. I have here an aglaonema, uh, an aglaonema or it's a Chinese evergreen, same as the um, previous soil, well-drained potting soil, 60 degrees and up is gonna be your best climate, humidity, typical household humidity, you don't have to do anything extra with these. You really want to water these a lot less frequently in the winter. Um, they will get very, um, they'll droop and they'll just get very soggy in their stems if you overwater them when it's um, a little bit cooler in the house. Nutrients, you can really only want to see, um, have these fertilized during the growing season, which is once a year. So stay away from any fertilizers during the winter. And for the light, um, bright light, but they can tolerate low light. I have here our snake plants and you can see the different types here. They like to be bunched up inside of your container. Um, they can actually bloom. I have not gotten them to bloom. My um, great grandmother has gotten hers to bloom though. What she said her trick was, was actually the opposite of what you typically hear about the light for snake plants. They say that it will do, it, it likes low light, but it will actually bloom with more bright indirect sun. Um, let's see what else. For the soil, same, well-drained potting soil, six degrees and up. You really wanna keep these leaves dry. They will also, um, wilt just fall over you'll see that they're not as strong the inside of these leaves keep water so therefore you want to water pretty minimally and allow the soil this is from my great grandmother some of her tricks to essentially almost be cracked before you really water these um the the roots on here are not very long or strong. Um, so you'll, you'll find a full snake plant, just one leaf, and it will have just little itty bitty baby roots on that. So overwatering just one time can be very detrimental to these snake plants. Nutrients, none. I personally do not put any kind of fertilizer into my snake plant. Next, I have a spider plant, which I love, mostly because it's one of the easiest things to propagate. So you can go into, uh, you know, a garden center. They'll have these, of course, in the greenhouse. Lots of humidity. They'll be absolutely beautiful. All of these babies coming off of them, you can see them here. All of these are babies off the mother plant. And all you have to do is cut that, put it in soil, and you've got a new plant. And with one spider plant, you can pretty much get plants all over your whole house. So I have that here as a pro. Oops, go back. So I have that here as a pro for your spider plant. You want to keep the soil lightly moist. If it's dry, you'll know because the leaves will start getting brown. You'll just get brown streaks on these. I don't add much fertilizer to my spider plants either. Um, again, well-drained potting soil. Um, and they will thrive with more humidity. So I do like to miss these guys. Here is the peace lily. I mentioned earlier that I had a plant that I just could not keep alive and it was constantly looking like this um, to the point where even more watering and it just got uglier and uglier. Um, I don't really know what was happening originally, but I know <laughs> now that I can keep my peace lily looking like this one here on the other side with some humidity. It, truly enjoys a lot of humidity. It enjoys a lot of light with, you know, kind of partial shade. So I have mine where it's a little bit further back, um, but the sun really does get to it. Um, let's see, what else? I actually found this really great trick of adding oxygen, and I do it specifically to this peace lily. 
I will brush my hair and take out that dry, clean hair, bury it in the soil, and you'll see it just within two to three hours, the leaves will pick right back up and it's really extremely happy again. Um, so this piece, Lily, very easy, started it all, has a very special place for me. Um, and a, a pro with this is it's a great sympathy plant. Um, it signifies rebirth of the soul as well as peace and hope. And I know a lot of people who give this plant to someone um, who has recently lost someone. Let's see. The next one is a ZZ plant. This is a really, really beautiful plant. Um, I've read a lot of different things about it maybe being poisonous or dangerous. I have one in my home. I enjoy it. It can also be easy to propagate. You take one of these bulbs here, place it in some water. These roots will start to come out and then you can go ahead and pop it in some soil. And then boom, you have another, a whole nother ZZ plant. Apparently these can also bloom. I think that you've got to really pay a lot of attention, make sure all of its, you know, environment is perfect. So the easiest way to do that, no humidity, these um, stems absolutely will rot and um, get too wet or dry on you. They get kind of wrinkly and really you're not sure if it's overwatered or underwatered, but you can tell if your leaves get yellow or brown and that helps you figure out whether it needs more or less water. In direct sun, I've actually, my very first ZZ plant, I burned it. Uh, I went and picked it up uh, from a neighbor. It was an August afternoon. I left it in the car for about an hour. I had a, a phone call and when I went back out, literally the leaves were burned. So this is something that you do not want to have bright direct light on. Here's our aloe vera, also known as the medicine plant. You want succulent soil for this. You really want the water to run through this. This can be in 55 degrees and up, no humidity at all. Allow your soil to dry completely, water deeply also. Nutrients, none. I believe a lot of um, salt can stay and hang out in this aloe vera soil. So we, that's why you really want to make sure that when you're watering, all of that bad stuff is flushing through. You're kind of flushing it when you water it. And then it wants bright and direct light. A pro with this aloe vera is it's pretty much drought resistant. So you cannot underwater it. And it's got great medicine purposes. Um, and then also for beauty and hair care is what it's used for. We have here the ponytail palm. These are just really pretty plants. Very easy. You just need some sun, some succulent soil. Also let it dry out. 65 degrees and up is the best climate. Humidity, also none. Water every two to three weeks. And I think I already have mentioned full sun for this ponytail palm. Pretty easy and a very pretty plant. We have here the philodendron, and it is going to like well-draining potting soil, 60 degrees and up. Prefers additional misting. I do like to mist all these philodendrons. They can get overwatered. It really depends on the size. As you can see, they really vary here. This is a big, beautiful outdoor um, giant philodendron. Here's a very small vining one. I have one of these. I have also this um, Monstera Delicioso, which is um, a really nice plant. It can get top heavy. So you might wanna put, you know, like a stick right in here um, to help it vine up. Um, but when it's going over, it really means it's growing a lot and it's, it's, it's a really beautiful plant. Um, this is a very masculine plant. I like to give these to any, um, you know, guys, a supervisor, a teacher or something. Um, they really enjoy this plant um, in general. So let's see here. Nutrients, you can fertilize it bi-monthly. Again, I mentioned that I like to um, dissolve my fertilizer into water and I'll just use that water when I water it next. Um, it's fine with low light, but it will grow much faster with more indirect light. 
So I have mine underneath in my west facing window, but I have, um, I'll usually keep a palm or my bird of paradise will be just where it's kind of giving it a little bit of a shadow. So it still gets a lot of sun, um, but not all of it. And then here is a Christmas cactus. This was also one of the first plants I had, which was a little bit tricky. Um, my grandmother had a Christmas cactus in her house and I just had to have one. Um, I've never gotten it to bloom the way that she has. Um, let's see, I've had mine for about two years and I only recently realized that it actually wants a fertilizer as well, but only when the buds form, which is about this time. That's why it's called a Christmas cactus. As the um, sun is out less and the days seem, um, I'm sorry, sorry, I had a little distraction. Um, so as there's less sun hours, then this guy will start to bloom. And you can actually kind of trick it if you want it to bloom in the summer. I haven't experimented with this, but you can actually place it in a very dark place for about two weeks and then bring it back out and trick it. And it will think that it's about this Christmas time frame-ish. It does like to be misted. And um, in the fall for blooming, you can water it once a week. Um, let's see here. Moderate light and some direct light. This, Christ this Christmas cactus will be very happy. So, and then there are tons of different colors. I do, um, I love the red. And there's pink. And there are just a bunch of different colors that you can pick with this Christmas cactus. Um... Let's see. And then well-drained pine soil also for this. I'm not sure if anybody else has had any other type of uh, potting soil, but I just use the regular potting soil with this. So here, um, I just wanted to share with you guys some of the house plants that I have. It's not all of them. I'm not even sure if it's half of them, but I, I do like to do some terrariums. Here's a succulent in a terrarium, and I just kind of misted him and he just was so beautiful in all of his glory. I've got this bamboo here and it's a really simple space. I just wanted to show you the way that bamboo was a great house plant as well. It's just in water and rocks and it grows heavenly as you can see. It will grow even better in soil, but I like where it's at here in the water. It's minimal upkeep and I clean that weekly. I just dump everything out, clean the rocks, fill the water back up, place it back there. And there's really, as you can see around it, as far as the sun it actually gets is pretty minimal. <clears throat> then over, I have a ficus and it does lovely in my west facing window as well. This is something that you would allow to dry out completely and then water also deeply. My next one, this is me and I'm um, messing around with my snake plants. You can see how I kind of mentioned about the roots. They're, they're um, really very easy to overwater. I didn't get to mention that they're also very easy to propagate as well. And then I have here, there's my monstera and my money tree here on the left. So I know that I mentioned earlier like what some aphids can do to your leaves. You can see this yellow and brown spot and some more of these yellow spots. Um, I wanted to show you guys, even though that you can get the pest, if you can get a hold of them, you really can still take your plant back and, and keep growing and, and it can still be beautiful. And actually that's it. So that is my whole presentation.